This episode of the Modern Therapist Survival Guide is brought to you by Thryzer. Thryzer is a modern billing platform for private pay therapists. Their platform automatically gets clients reimbursed by their insurance after every session. Just by billing your clients through Thryzer, you can potentially save them hundreds every month with no extra work on your end. The best part is you don't have to give up your rates. They charge a standard 3% processing fee. Listen at the end of the episode for more information on a special offer from Thryzer. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. I'm Kurt Widhelm with Katie Vernoy, and this is the podcast for therapists where we talk about a lot of the things that affect our practices, the clients that we see. And as we move closer and closer to having now 300 episodes, uh, we are still finding areas of our podcast that we have not covered at all or very much in depth. And we're very excited for the first time to be exploring some of the new cultures that we haven't covered here. And this is looking at Native Americans, First Nations, Indigenous, and especially the way that it impacts some of maybe people who get better credit for doing things than they didn't really cite where they're sources came from or where their influences came from. So <laughs> we are joined today by Dr. Sydney Stone Brown, a member of the Blackfeet tribe and partially where I grew up in northern Montana, very near the Blackfeet reservation. And we are very thankful to have you talking to us today about the influences that have permeated the rest of the field and really where we should be giving credit. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to reach out to more people and to also help them understand that we need to give uh, recognition to Indigenous elders, teachers who have passed on knowledge to the area of behavioral and mental health services. One, for example, is Erickson, who received a lot of information from the Lakota people and Yurok in California that actually became his model for child development. Young studied with the Hopi people and was trained by Hopi elders. So I had heard over the years that Maslow had had contact with our tribe, but that was all I knew. And when I went up to do a training on the Sisica Reserve, the Blackfoot Reserve, uh, just south of Calgary, Alberta, I was presenting what I had learned and how I wanted to talk about native self-actualization. And I remember one of the elders standing up in the, in the group and saying to me, where did you get that? And I said, I dreamt it. And she mm. said, oh, we've been looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, they sat down and talked to me and um, basically asked me to write a book to showcase the the real presentation of actualization, which isn't their word, but it's the word that we know in psychology and social work, human services. But they wanted people to know that Maslow's hierarchy of need was formulated after he had contact with the Blackfoot elders. And the Blackfoot elders had told him about our way of life and what he discovered in his contact in 1938, and he wrote unpublished papers that I found in the archives in 1940, and he, he never did publish or acknowledge what he learned from the Blackfoot elders. And so they were basically asking me to set the record straight, to be able to view it from an indigenous perspective rather than from a doctrine of discovery and a hierarchical system. So it, it it changed my life as I learned more from them because I understood that Maslow's hierarchy of need came out of uh, his work primarily with uh, corporations. He was an I.O. guy. 
Uh, oh, wow. He actually did a lot of work and training with corporations, and they wanted him to share what he was sharing in a pyramid. Now, here we've got capitalism, <laughs> <laughs> and we have a pyramid, and he's sharing his perspective of what he learned from the Blackfoot people and what he, how he formulated, and it's unique to him. It was his, um, but how he formulated it. And when the elders saw that years later, they're saying, that isn't what we taught him. That mm -hmm. isn't how we shared this. It's different. So for me to be able to say that the Blackfoot people are saying, set the record straight by saying there is no hierarchy in our worldview. And Maslow was very stunned when he was of the archaeological group who was studying the Blackfoot people at the expense of the Canadian government. They wanted to know more about our people. And Maslow came in because he was from the East Coast. He had never had contact with Native people before. And he basically was kind of blown away when yeah. he discovered that these folks really know what they're talking about. Because he said he had been studying and using an instrument of measure of security. And when he looked at those questions and, and applied them to the Blackfoot people on the Sisica Reserve, they didn't fit. Because he said on the East Coast, maybe 5% of the people are secure. Mm. And what he found amongst the Blackfoot people was, and his estimate was um, toned down by other people who read his paper, but his estimate was 90, 95% of our people were secure. And he, he, that blew him away. He went up there, a monkey man. He went up there ready to study with Harlow and, and do all of that. And he ended up leaving the, the Blackfoot nation and going back to uh, his work, and he became the humanist that we know he became. So I think the Blackfoot people transformed him by their encounter with him and the teachings that they passed on. So when you look at the hierarchy of need, you know that's a European model. We don't yeah. have pyramids, by the way. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, we do have teepees, and sure. a lot of our stories and teachings are done with the lodge to help people understand human development and uh, passages through phases of development. Uh, what I did is I took his pyramid, basically, and turned it upside down. So if you, if you do that, just take his Maslow hierarchy of needs and turn it upside down and see what you see. Because that's closer to what the Blackfoot people, the elders, wanted me to convey. So I did write a book. It is called Transformation Beyond Greed, Native Self-Actualization. I self-published because if you publish through a big publishing company, they take all the rights, they have the mm -hmm. copyright, and they tell you what to put in the book. And it's been out there in the world in Indian country for quite some time now. And I need to get it internationally because I have done training in Australia and the indigenous people over there very much related to the model and said that they wanted to use it. So right now the book is being used as a textbook by the University of North Dakota doctoral program uh, in clinical psychology. It's being used in the Blackfeet Community College uh, nursing program. Uh, is using it as one of their sources for their coursework. Wow. What people I'm finding in indigenous populations is that they're beginning to understand the implications of what the Blackfoot teachings are really about and how they can affect the world. And I, I hope that what we do by the time my great granddaughter, grandson, are out there in the world functioning as a uh, Blackfoot people and teachers that everyone will look at Maslow's hierarchy as something that supported capitalist thinking and belief yeah. system, uh, allowing only 5% of the population to be uh, actualized, when in reality for Native populations, Indigenous worlds, everyone has a purpose, everyone 
is brought here for a reason. We're all to make a contribution and based on altruistic values, uh, give back to the world. And it, and when you flip that paradigm of the teepee replacing the pyramid and it's inverted, you begin to see the world very differently. And I, I hope that we can change how damaged our world and this earth mother of ours has been because it's based on greed. Yes. It's based on power. It's based on control. It, it makes all brown and black people and um, people of color as uh, subhuman and that we are not equivalent to or able to function in that worldview. And no wonder we don't want to assimilate. Of course. <laughs> no wonder course. we don't want further colonization. And so it really is saying we have to step back and look at this differently. And I know I'm speaking to many non-Native people, and I understand that. But I want you to step back and think about it in this way. We all came from villages. We're all Indigenous people how far removed you are from that attachment and that relationship really determines the assimilation and the in acculturation uh, into this capitalistic world. And what I'm suggesting our task is, is to inculturate people to return them to the basis of a relationship with the world where we know everything is alive we have responsibility and duties, and that we work in a reciprocal way. Now, that's a very easy way to tell you what altruism is. Sure. It, it's giving back. It's not just taking, but it's always reciprocal. Thank you so much. I, we typically start our, our episodes asking our, our guests to, to say who they are and, and what they're putting out in the world. I think you, you took care of the what are you putting out into the world, and I want to <laughs> dig into that very deeply. But before we started recording, you also shared a little bit more about who you are and how you are situated within the world, and I'd love to, to share that with our audience. I'm uh, 75 years old. I have worked in the field of substance disorder for over uh, 50 years. I, I celebrated my 50th year of recovery on May 10th. Congratulations. But I was working with addiction and uh, alcoholism long before I got my own recovery. I just didn't see myself as one of them. I was someone different. I drank differently. So we all come to a point of realization that we are impaired and that we are diminished by the use of mood altering substances. And for me, it, it happened from 19 to 24 years of age. And I decided I wanted something different in my life. And that began my journey. So I continue to work in the field of substance disorder and co-occurring treatment. And I will, uh, till the end of, of my life, I believe. So we're here and thinking beyond those limitations of age, but rather thinking about what do our elders bring to us and how do we convey that knowledge to the world so it, it isn't lost. Because with every death of one of our elders, we just lost a library. We just lost yes. the wisdom and the knowledge, uh, the language. So I, I work at the Navajo Nation. I am a behavioral health director. We have residential and outpatient services, and I am looking for, for people who want to work in this field. <laughs> Here's my recruitment. Yeah. Uh, if you have a, a license as a substance disorder counselor, if, if you are Navajo, come home. We need you. Um, but really what I want to say is that I chose to work here for the last 10 and a half years, almost 11 because I am surrounded by people who live their culture and who are uh, fluent in their language and who are reaching out to help the next generation so that we don't have to replicate the trauma and harm that we've experienced and that we can have a good life. And instead of 
teaching us how to be resilient in a traumatic world. It's about time that we teach people how to be resilient and thrive and do the best that they can and be the best that they can and get better as they learn more. So it's it's an important journey and it's called life. (laughs) I love that. A lot of your work is based on this native self-actualization model. And I'm hoping that you can give us what this looks like and what you're hoping that our audience can walk away from and how your process came to to make this. I think to, to speak to that question, and thank you for asking it, uh, we have to go back and look at um, the hierarchy uh, of Maslow's model. And if, if you know his model, and almost everybody who works in the helping services knows it, um, there the pyramid at the bottom is physiological needs and then safety needs then social needs, then esteem, and then self-actualization. And uh, actually, I've had uh, people contact me to tell me that the the, uh, first use of the term self-actualization was in 1700s. So it's not something he created, but something that he used to convey information. So if you... If you think about the poverty level of most Americans, and I'm going to say that truthfully, I mean, people live paycheck to paycheck. For those of us that have gone on to school, we have student loans. I still owe $121,000, and I've been working at this for uh, since 2000. Uh, let's say 12, I think, is when I started my payments after a deferment. Um, I owed $146,000 when I graduated. Wow. No forgiveness, um, misinformation. All of these things create financial disparities for individuals who choose to uh, go on with their life but can't afford. So, yes, I'm a first generation in my family of getting a college degree. I got a little carried away because now I have two masters and a doctor. (laughs) 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 I got to learn more. I got to figure this out. It doesn't make any sense to me. But let's talk about that inverted lodge. And I want you to think of it differently. That when people come into the world, they come in with already a spiritual promise. They already have a purpose for arriving. We call them and they come and they choose us and choose to be a part of our life. And in that process, what we have is an opportunity to welcome them. So when that that little life enters this physical world, what we're really doing is welcoming a spirit from the spirit world. And I remember telling my elder a uh, teacher who I talk about in the book, um, Devere Eastman, uh, Ray Buffalo said, I said, I'm going to have a baby. And he, he goes, you're going to have a teacher. <laughs> mm, there you go. He said, they got it all wrong in that other world. He said, we're, we're taught by them if we listen. And that's true. That's absolutely true. I have three adult daughters and nine grandchildren, and they're all teachers to me. So yes, we come into this world with a promise. And then think of the lodge. If you've ever been in a teepee, uh, they have what's called the teepee lining, and it goes up partially in the in the wall. When when that teepee lining is put up, yeah, it is a place to put the insulation to keep the lodge cool or warm. And so family represent that teepee lining, that that it's there to protect that little spiritual being that just arrived. And so the nurturing of a child, uh, it, we didn't have large families like the European families. We had smaller families and 
they got very close attention and and mothers typically had only two children and out of those two children they would spend their life protecting and caring for that child so when i hear all of these things about abortion and i remember asking an elder did we have a, anything like that and he said no we welcomed every child but they also knew how to do a protection so that you didn't have more children. And I asked him, what about contraceptives? And he said, well, you'd have to talk to the women about that. <laughs> I, I can't tell you about that. So some of our modern stressors that we face were actually things that, that indigenous populations had to face too. They had to answer these questions. You don't bring more people into the world than you can support then you can raise, then you can nurture and love. And so this idea that you have any number of children makes no sense at all when there's going to be starvation and death and unwanted children. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you look at the philosophy of indigenous populations, they knew it was important to protect kin. It was important to raise children and, and to nurture and love them and every child knowing that they were wanted and valued. And that's what the teepee lining represents. The next uh, place in the, the teachings of the elders is that we all have a place to fit into the community. So indigenous populations, including the Blackfoot people, had clans, we had societies, and we had roles and responsibilities so that when you were born into a particular family, when you were raised in that family, you were also raised in that culture of the society and the clan and the relationship to the community. And when you know that you have a place that you fit and belong, that's really what we're talking about in terms of security. I'm protected. I'm wanted. And I'm also have a place. And, and rather than raising children to tell them what you want them to be, uh, you raise your children to allow them to find that spiritual promise that they bring into the world and that they share with the world. And you stay out of the way, but you support and help them to realize that. So in that process of raising children, they find where they fit and belong to carry out that spiritual promise. And then the, the next level of, of giving and being is to be able to practice altruism, that, that you're taught by your life experiences that you help and it is reciprocated and that that relationship of of being there for each other and taking care of each other and helping each other and sharing is so contrary to the concept of greed. So I really think the book named itself. I didn't name mm -hmm. it. But to really help people understand our world is suffering. People are suffering because as we grow and as we live in this world, we see the disparities. And it was never meant that just a few could have extreme wealth at the expense of everyone else. And the last place, and in, in, um, Maslow called it self-actualization. So in, in order to get people to understand, and sometimes you have to speak in their frame of reference and their worldview, I did call it native self-actualization. But I want you to remove the word self and native actualization. And what is native? It means close to nature. That means I understand that I breathe oxygen because the tree produces that. Mm -hmm. And I have a living responsibility to take care of the trees. So that spiritual relationship is also part of that actualization of realization that I'm here to give and to leave the world a better place and 
that we're here to cooperate and collaborate with one another. So if you look at the inverted lodge, the first placement would be welcoming that child. The second placement would be protecting that child. The third place would be helping them understand their roles and responsibilities in the society and the ceremonies and the relationship to the, to the language, to the land, to the teachings. And then practicing altruism. It's not what you say, but what you do. And that's how the children learn. And by young adults, they're taking care of each other and they're preparing to have their own families. And then that we have a spiritual purpose for being here. So when someone comes along and says that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the only way to explain human development and, and human journey, the elder said, no, help the world understand that we had these teachings and we lived this way. Anthropologists tell us now it's 10,000 years that they can prove that we've been there mm. on that same area of land across both of the, the parks, Glacier Park. Uh, there's a Waterton Park up in, I think it's called that in Canada, and the Yellowstone Park. That's all Blackfoot territory. And take it all the way over almost into the Dakotas and straight north into Saskatchewan and way up to Edmonton, and that was our territory. So what, what the elders are saying, we lived this for thousands of years. We've learned and we know how to do this. And yeah. they want to pass that knowledge on to the world. So Maslow got it. It's just how I think the corporations pressured him to present it. And in the book, I talk about uh, a relative of his coming up to me when I was doing a training in Anchorage, and the relative said, Maslow's gone. And I said, I knew that. And he said, he would have liked your model. Because when I talk about the eight domains of an assessment instrument I worked on and is ready to be used electronically, um, the eight domains measure what I call Native actualization. So the first domain is how do you believe in a power greater than yourself? The second domain is how do you spend your free time? The third domain is who do you want to learn from? And the fourth domain is how do you describe family? And then when I started my dissertation, I added four more time because indigenous world is circular time. In the moment, everything in the past and everything in the future is held in that moment. It's all interrelated, interconnected. And language, the fluency of the language, if we don't protect and continue speaking our language, we will lose all of that indigenous knowledge. The next one I said is cultural connectedness, because yes, I've been an expert witness for ICWA cases. Uh, to have that connectedness and what a harm of adoption and foster care and boarding schools and orphanages did to our people is horrendous. And now we have another version of it. It's missing and murdered children missing and murdered women. Uh, it's almost like they do not want us to survive. And yet, despite all the harm, we have survived. And the last domain I added was food. Our relationship to our traditional, our bodies for thousands of years have lived a certain way and prepared to eat and, and digest food in a certain way. and then we have all these modern foods that are causing so much harm to the organs, uh, harm in terms of blood sugar levels, uh, diabetes, heart disease. Uh, all of these things can be changed if we eat differently. So those are the eight domains that are in my uh, assessment. And people are either placed in a modern worldview with intent to become enculturated 
or a traditional worldview and wanting to learn how they can live in a modern world. And so we really need both worldviews and you take the best from both and live according to your personal spiritual purpose for being here. So that's my idea of native self-actualization. And I, if you look at it, it's two octagons, actually. And there's the eight uh, that build on each other and re- interrelate to each other. So when I show the two octagons to the Blackfoot elders, when I was presenting up there, they said, where did you get that? I said, I dreamed it. And they said, oh, we've been looking for you. <laughs> mm. So uh, they knew I knew, not because I had learned it in a book or because I was in a, yeah, or thought it up on my own, but rather that I had that intergenerational ancestral tie to the knowledge of the Blackfoot people. And I I really like Maslow. I want people to understand that. And I always felt drawn to him. My first psychology class, I go, hmm, this makes sense to me. But I, when I learned what the Blackfoot people were teaching him, I felt the world needed to know that we can look at this differently because right now that hierarchy of needs is causing harm. Just a few people being able to be actualized And I would like to believe that everyone can be actualized. It's interesting because in the book, you talk about once you, once someone is self-actualized, quote unquote, self-actualized, then their, their task is to serve, that that is a higher purpose. And I think that's, that is very much anti-capitalist. I think there's, there's so much that goes into, I mean, you succinctly put it as greed, but I think there's that element of, of seeking out my own best benefit as the highest highest calling, so to speak, versus recognizing how we fit into society and how we fit into the collective, really, the the, the group of folks that are all here together. And and I really like this different idea. And and reading the work that you that you put into this, I just I felt very, very moved by it. And I also recognize that there are many powers and forces that don't want this uh, native actualization. They, they like the, 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 the 5%, the 2%, the whatever, the 0.01% having all of this uh, power. And, and I guess for me, there's, there's, there's two lines of inquiry that we could go to. I think there's this, this element of being able to support natives in, in their own work and in reconnecting because there's the, the concept of that uh, Clement bear chief said about having holes. And I want to talk about that. And then there's also kind of transforming the world and bringing this outside of the native people. So, so maybe I, you know, we're, I think we're going to have a long episode, Kurt, (laughs) maybe we can talk, talk about, you know, in truth, kind of native mental health and, and, and the work that you're doing, as well as this idea of filling holes um, that, that, that you talk about in the book. And then maybe we can kind of move back out into needing sure. to, to sure. Uh, kind of decolonize and, and become more anti-capitalist to save the, the planet and, and all the people in it. <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one to describe with words, because when Clement Bear Chief was teaching me about these things, um, I cried a lot. And and he later told me he thought I had allergies. And I said, no, I'm I'm in my adult life and I'm learning things that I had a right to know as a child, as a young person, to guide me and to assist me in understanding the world. And and he he told me some of the stories I knew, and I told him some of the stories I knew, and and he corrected me that nothing in our stories was sexualized, nothing was hurtful, and that Europeans came and those stories got twisted and turned and and made into sexualized stories. And I think that's part of the grooming of non-natives influencing Mm. us and harming our children and harming our women. So I, uh, when I see a movie like, uh, oh gosh, what was it called? where the guy gets attacked by a bear and is all alone and travels. And it shows a, a woman, a native woman 
in in a log house being abused uh, and being used sexually. I can't stand watching those kinds of things because what it tells me is how many of our families were destroyed by the greed and and the misuse of human beings for somebody's personal gratification or sense of power. Uh, but when I think about those things, I, I, I want us to stop and, and protect the children, protect the women, protect the men, and give them dignity and a sense of self, because we're all warriors, and we all have responsibility to take care of each other in that way. So for me, it's, it's, it's understanding that we are in a process of transforming a very damaged world that is upside down, that needs to be turned in a direction of protecting the earth, protecting the atmosphere, protecting the animals. So Clement was telling me about our relationship with the buffalo, and, and every tribe has their own relationship. Uh, my husband, who passed a year ago, uh, he's Paiute from Northern California, small reserve reservation there, uh, Fort Bidwell. And he, I told him the story of buffalo, and he said, we just had gophers. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, deer and other things, but anyway, <clears throat> he liked the story of the buffalo. <clears throat> but the creator uh, in, in putting us here helped us and gave us teachers. And our teachers are our environment. It's the world around us. It's the animals. It's the plants. Um, it's the relationship to the land. And Clement was saying how creator... Uh, started calling all the little creatures to say, we need to clothe these guys. They're, they they don't have any fur. <laughs> we, we need to, to feed them. They, they're going to be hungry, you know. So long story short is he called and, and here come the mice. We'll help, we'll help, we'll help. No, no I don't think that'll quite uh, make what I need, have in mind. And the gophers came and, and uh, the badgers and uh even the deer and the elk and the moose. And then they heard the thunder. And it was powerful. And it was all the buffalo coming forward. And they stopped in front of Creator. And they said, we will care for these people. We will provide for them. We will help them. That's our relationship to the buffalo. So when they couldn't kill us, when they couldn't beat us in war, they killed off the buffalo, millions, so that the people would starve, so they could have the land. They didn't want us. Clement said, the buffalo sacrificed themselves so we could survive. And I'm one of those survivors. I'm one of those people that shouldn't have any attachment or any relationship or even care. So when we think about how things change, we have to step back to the beginning. That's why I ask non-Native people, find your village. Find where your people are from. If you find that village, you're going to find the dialect. And you're going to find the relationship of that village to that land and your indigenous ties. So when it's them and us, it's not true. We're all human beings and we need to help each other and care about each other and stop the harmful ways that this world has become. So I see this teaching by the Blackfoot people replicated in other tribes. They have their own way of describing it. I work with the Navajo, the Dene people. Uh, they have their own way of explaining things. 
but we have many things in common. And in that commonality, we find consensus. We find a way to get things done. We find a way to relate to one another. So when I first got my doctorate and I was working in an ICWA program in Denver, Colorado, the kids would be sent to see Dr. Brown. Now, I don't want to see Dr. Brown. They they think I'm going to give them a shot. <laughs> I said, tell them I'm a rent-a-grandma. <laughs> <laughs> so I became rent-a-grandma in Denver there for a while. Because we have to level this hierarchy and we have to level so that we can have a relationship with one another. And so when when Clement was talking to me, and the only way I can show you is most people know how to make a church, right? <laughs> yeah, I, you got to have learned that somewhere along the line. Okay, and there's the steeple. All right, so just close it down like this and have all those fingers fitting together. And see, that's how we used to live. That was our relationship to the world. And then colonization came and started taking things away. They removed our children and put them in boarding schools. They told us we couldn't speak our language. They told us we couldn't have our ceremonies. They told us we couldn't be on the land we were on. They pushed and shoved us around. And they took away our food stores and our source for clothing. Everything that we lived was changed. So I want you to just imagine for a minute what it feels like for these aliens to come (laughs) and say there's nothing right about you. The way you walk, the way you talk, the way you live, the food you eat, the clothes you wear, the way you smell, all of those things are wrong. And they have to be changed. That, to me, is what Maslow's hierarchy of need looks like. Is that push for change rather than accepting people as indigenous people. And so, basically, when Clement was saying, fill the holes, he's saying, pull us all back together again. Put us together in a way that we can be united and connected and help and care about each other. How does that look in the work that we can do with our clients? In in other words, taking these very important cultural lessons in 21st century therapy, can how does that look? What does that look like? I am in a federally funded program, third party revenue. Medicaid reimbursement, (laughs) insurance companies, all those things are a part of our reality here. We fight for the right. We haven't got it yet, but we we fight for the right for our traditional practitioners, the Diné medicine people that we have on staff who hold ceremonies and conduct groups and pass on teachings. We want them to be paid as though they were doctorates. Because they are. My, my Indian name was given to me by Peter uh, Weasel Moccasin. And Peter is one of the Blackfoot elders and teachers from the Kainai, the Blood Reserve in Canada and Alberta. And he passed his name on to me, which means protector of the circle. He said, because, Sid, that's what you've been doing with your life. That's how you've lived your life. And he gave me his name. That's a great honor to have that name. But it's a lot to live up to as well. It goes, the responsibility is there with that name and the honoring. And I just heard that Peter was given an honorary doctorate from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, acknowledging his wisdom and knowledge. And, and I want to say that, that that's an example of what couldn't have happened in Maslow's era. They wouldn't have allowed that to happen, to honor those elders that taught him. Because we were seen as stupid. We were seen as subhuman. 
and that we had no rights. I remember sitting in my master's program in 1972, being told by a statistics professor that the only reason that I could be in that class and study statistics was because I was part white, because wow. Indians couldn't do that. So I said, then you don't know my relatives. You don't know the leaders that I have in my family. And, it, you know, there are really well-known chiefs down here in the States. And I think of, of the chiefs in my family, Mountain Chief, Fool's Crow. Those, those people, the Lakota teachers, those are the people that frame our life and teach us how to live in a good way. You know, uh, I really want people to understand we were not ignorant. We were far more advanced. And now society, this is what our elders are saying. Maybe this society is ready to listen to us, to, to hear our indigenous knowledge. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so too. So I want to make sure that we're, because we are definitely longer than normal episodes, uh, Sydney. So I want to make sure that we are sharing what you want us to have shared. Um, I feel like we, we're going to need to revisit at some point. So we obviously can't talk about every single thing, but, but what would be one more, two more questions that you might want to make sure that we ask that we can can include in the episode. I think understanding the relationship of intergenerational knowledge. My first teachers, because I was in an urban setting, were Lakota. So my teacher teacher was Fool's Crow. If you look him up, you'll find his writings and, and uh, things that were published about his wisdom and knowledge. Crowfoot is my great-grandmother's uncle at uh, she called him grandpa because her, her grandpa was gone. And so I always knew that he was one of our, our elders and our teachers. He's our, our grandpa. Being separated by generations doesn't mean you're separated from that knowledge. And he was instrumental in Treaty 7 being created. And when the... The Cree, uh, that's a story too, uh, the Cree wanted him to go and fight with them against the Redcoats. And he said, no, because we need to survive. If we go into that battle, how many of us will survive? And the preservation and the protection and the continuation of our way of life, our language, our culture, is essential. That's what I got from him as a teacher. So it's intergenerational knowledge that we're beginning to honor. And I think that as we share the things that we've been taught, we have an opportunity to understand giving back. Um, Crowfoot had, had been in a battle uh, when one of his teenage sons was killed. Uh, and the Cree were always fighting with us over territory, and we would hold, a, hold the line, so to speak, and maintain our territory, because that's survival. And uh, they had a council meeting, and what happened is these, these leaders of the Cree nation and the Blackfoot people got together. And in that council, Crowfoot looked across the room, and he saw a young man that looked like his son who was killed in the battle. And they're trying to, to, to find a way to resolve the conflict. And what Crowfoot did is he took that young man as part of the agreement. He would raise this orphan boy that looked like his son that he had just lost and that he would raise him. Now, if you've ever heard a pound maker, that's him. Crowfoot raised him. So pound makers coming to, to his dad and saying, come on, let's fight these red coats. And dad is saying, no, we will survive. And that's what's more important than winning that battle. 
to me, that's ultimate altruism. How do we take the most hurtful and harmful and make something better of it? So yes, uh, it's intergenerational knowledge that we're retrieving and acknowledging and honoring indigenous knowledge around the world. So when I presented in Australia at two universities over there, they absolutely related to us. I have a little tiny gold uh, kangaroo that was given to me by one of the women when I gave her my book. She said, I'm so glad to have your book, but I want you to have this. And I brought back a little gold kangaroo. She said, I've worn this for 20 years, but I want you to have it. To me, that reciprocal, um, it's never dollar for dollar. It's reciprocal. And when we can learn to do that, when we can learn to give, then we're helping each other. So when you contacted me and you said you wanted to do a podcast with me and learn more about my my work, uh, that's reciprocal. You you noticed I didn't ask you how much are you going to pay me? (laughs) (laughs) Or how much are you going to make off of this and what's my share? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that's that hierarchical system. But I know that when we help each other and care about each other and reach across those boundaries that are artificial, that we're all human beings. So how do we use this in our clinical work? We use it with SNAP. What's the strengths? What's the needs? Uh, what the abilities are? What the preference is? What's a preference of worldview? There's SNAP. We use it in DAP, right? A treatment plan. Um, develop the treatment plan, and write about the progress in the, in the DAP note. So is it clinically appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are CARF accredited, and I can tell you that when they come in and visit us and see our ceremonies and see our Hogan and, and see our sweat lodge and see um, master's and doctorate level providers as well as indigenous providers, they go, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't know how to behave. They don't know that they, they can't, they don't know what questions to ask. Yeah. Uh, they don't understand the relationship of the tribe as a sovereign nation, making the rules and regulations just as another nation would. So we're a nation within a nation. And I always tease them down here. I say I'm a Blackfoot loner. (laughs) 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 I've been here so long. Maybe it's a short-term lease. I'm not sure. But you just try to be good to each other and take care of each other and move the harmful, hurtful. And maybe they will change. Maybe they won't. But don't let them hurt anybody anymore. That, to me, is, is what that protection part is about. I hope I've answered your questions today. Yes, yes, you have. (laughs) For those in our audience who want to pursue more of your knowledge and find your book, where can we direct them to? I usually first guide them to the Facebook page for Transformation Beyond Greed. And uh, we are putting up a website, which is transformationbeyondgreed.com. And they can visit there. Both those sites have interviews that I've done over the years that are available. They're just uh, one is a short video of 15 minutes, I think. And the one that's on the website is an hour long. And that's just transfer of knowledge. That's passing on information. And then people contact me for the book. Uh, I am moving it to Ingram uh, Publisher, and it will be available in the near future, hopefully this month. Um, But uh, the one I have now is uh, smaller and it's black and white. And the new one, the smaller one is 1995. And that's just basically covering costs and that assists me in in making these kinds of uh, outreach efforts that I'm making today. Also, uh, the new book will be larger, larger print, and it will be in color. So all of the graphics and um, slides that are in the book will actually be there. The important thing is to communicate. But I also want to remind people that I'm doing this because Maslow didn't. 
Yes. I'm doing this because it's possible now. I don't think they would have listened to Maslow if he tried to explain what he learned from the Blackfoot people. So it's time, and we need to help each other and teach each other. And we will happily provide links in our show notes. You can find those over at mtsgpodcast.com. And please follow us on our social media and continue the conversation in our Facebook group, the Modern Therapist Group. And until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhelm with Katie Vernoy and Dr. Sydney Brown. Thanks again to our sponsor, Thryzer. Thryzer is a new billing platform for therapists that was built on the belief that therapy should be accessible and clinicians should earn what they are worth. Every time you bill a client through Thryzer, an insurance claim is automatically generated and sent directly to the client's insurance. From there, Thryzer provides concierge support to ensure clients get their reimbursement quickly and directly into their bank account. By eliminating reimbursement by check, confusion around benefits, and obscurity with reimbursement status, they allow your clients to focus on what actually matters rather than worrying about their money. It is very quick and easy to get set up, and it works great with EHR systems. Their team is super helpful and responsive, and the founder is actually a longtime therapy client who grew frustrated with his reimbursement times. Thryzer lets you become more accessible while remaining in complete control of your practice. Better experience for your clients during therapy means higher retention. Money won't be the reason they quit on therapy. Sign up using bit.ly forward slash modern therapists and use the code modern therapist if you want to test Thryzer completely risk free. You will get one month of no payment processing fees, meaning you earn 100% of your cash rate during that time. Once again, sign up at bit.ly forward slash modern therapists and use the code modern therapists if you want to test Thryzer completely risk free. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes. 